Praise God. We are still on the test, trials, and temptation series. And uh, so let's go to God in prayer as we consider His Word. Father, we just thank You for Your precious Word. We ask, O God, that as we continue to establish Your Word in our lives, that we will grow in You. And even more, Lord, not just grow in knowledge, but to truly grow to love You, to appreciate You more, week by week, day by day. We ask, O God, that you continue to establish your love in our lives. And this love that is pure, that is holy, this love, O God, that transforms our lives. For your word declares that you are the God of love. And you so love us that you gave your only begotten Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And so, Father, as we come before you afresh today, we thank you, Lord, that you help us understand the things of this life, the things that we face, the reality of human existence, by which we do have tests, trials, and temptations. We know that none of us escape from that, not even Jesus. But yet, O oh Father, we know that with every test, trial, and temptation, that you provide a way of escape for us. You provide us the grace, sometimes not just to avoid those things, but to go through those things. And to be able to overcome each one of the tests, trials, and temptations that come our way. And we ask, O oh God, that we will appreciate this grace that you have upon our lives. Teach us today as we consider your strength, your power, and your ability within us. Glorify Jesus again in our midst. Lift him so high and exalted that we would all grow to love him even more. We thank you, Father. We covenant to always give you the glory, the worship, and the honor for all that you do. Let your glory indeed shine on us that we may bask in your glory and in the light of your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Bless each one mightily. Bring a word of healing, a word of blessing, a word of confirmation to each life in all, all that we are going through in our lives. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and everyone say Amen. Praise God. We have touched on various things. We did touch on the book of Job, and uh, we also did touch on uh, the area about uh, love and forgiveness in the Lord uh, last week. And uh, we just need to wrap up a little bit more on the book of Job. And uh, we just want to look at the book of James chapter 5 first to see what the Bible says about Job and what we can learn from him as we conclude on some lessons that we can learn from Job. Yes, there are lessons that we can indeed learn from Job. And this test trials and temptation series is still continuing. So this is part of the series. In the Bible, in James chapter 5, it says here, uh, bringing Job as a good example to us, in verse 11, it says, uh, let's read verse 10 and 11, James chapter 5. It says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Apparently, in this life, every one of us will go through test trials and temptations. And the key is to understand them. The key is to be able to learn how to find the grace of God through whatever trials and temptations that we all go through. And blessed is the man or woman who discovers the grace of God in the midst of their trials and their temptations and tests. In verse 11, it says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance, and the word perseverance here is hupomone, which is uh, one of the Greek words for patience. There are two Greek words for patience. And verse 10, the word patience is makrotumio, 
And verse 11, the word endure, or translated patience in the uh, Old King James, but endure in the new one says, or perseverance in the new one says, you have heard of the hupomone or perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And as we have discovered in our lessons in the book of Job, that the whole story of Job was, was a lesson to teach us that uh, God does not work in our lives based on our righteousness, based on us keeping the law. If not for the mercies of God, we all, if we were to say, hey, we are living righteously, Job was living righteously, he walked in integrity, and that every one of us is rewarded based on uh, the law of sowing and reaping. If God is going to reward us just merely by the law of sowing and reaping, the whole world will be destroyed now. That's something we need to realize. That the world as it exists does not exist because there is enough goodness to keep us all alive on planet Earth. But they exist because of the mercy of God. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians chapter 3, which we have uh, gone through before, but we're just revising for those of you here in the first time, that uh, the law was given in order to preserve the earth until Christ could come. In fact, the world was uh, like dropping into sin. And there was a time that God had to destroy the whole planet because there was so much evil and sin. We know that story in, Galatia, uh, in Genesis 3 uh, when only eight souls survived, Noah and his three sons. So we do know that uh, the world is on a path of self-destruction. And if God did not do anything, there would have to be another destruction. And so God, instead of doing that, the Bible in Galatians 3 says that as the world is on its way to destruction and all over again we will have a second flood, a second Noah, but God wouldn't flood the earth again because He promised Noah He won't destroy the earth by a flood. And uh, we all know ultimately the whole earth will be destroyed again this time by fire at the end of Revelation. But uh, as the earth was on this path of destruction, God sent the law and the law preserved like salt preserving meat from decaying. God sent the law just to preserve the earth a little bit longer. Until Christ can come, by which through Christ's salvation and atonement, the earth can be renewed again. So God's plan was always that His blessings to us come based on His mercy his grace and His love. Even in the Old Testament, David sings of the mercies of God in the book of Acts 3, he quotes. How David saw that it was through God's mercy. Blessed is a man whom the Lord uh, counts his iniquities as a cleanse and forgiven. So he perceived that everything that we have on this earth, that we enjoy on this earth, is a result of God's love, God's mercy which is the story of Job, that in the end, Job was arguing his righteousness and his three friends were arguing cause and effect. And they were wrong. So was Job. And he discovered that God blessed him not because of his righteousness, but God blessed him because somewhere in the heart of Job, he loved the Lord. And we established that that the only way God works in our life is through discerning our love for Him. As you know, right here in this place, God loves every one of us equally, including those right now who's hearing this message online. God loves every one of us equally because He's a fair and just God. But in this place, and all those hearing this message all over the world, we do not love God equally. Some of us here love God more than another person. Perhaps a person sitting two rows from you love God more than you. Because only God sees our heart. And why is that so? It should not be. We need to learn how to grow to love God more. And we saw how part of learning to love God more is learning 
forgiveness. Learning to experience how we don't deserve God's love, but His love is unconditional to our lives. And that was the story of Job, how he realized and he repented from his self-righteousness, realizing that he was blessed not because of his righteousness. He was blessed because God saw his love. And we have established the fact that the whole story of this Bible is the story of God loving us and we reaching out in love towards God. And sometimes God permits us to express our love towards Him in different ways. And Job discovered that, that if he kept his righteousness, he kept the law, he was a man of integrity and upright, God was not blessing him based on those things that he did. If God did, God will be blessing it based on works. And no one is justified by works. But behind what he did was his love. He was righteous because he wanted to please God. He wanted to show God he loved him. And the same way we see in Romans chapter 14, that sometimes Paul says, well, if someone uh, ate vegetables or someone ate meat and vegetables, uh, both are all right. Say, why? What kind of Christianity? Both are all right. Isn't that law that tells us what is right and what is wrong? Strictly speaking, it is correct to eat both meat and vegetables. But he says, those who eat just vegetables, they did it because that's the way they want to show their love to God. So Paul says, let them be. And those who want to eat both meat and vegetables, they do it because they feel the freedom in God and they love God. So Paul says, that's all right. And there are some in Romans 14 that want to keep one day to the Lord. Some others keep all days as holy to the Lord. And Paul says, both are also okay. What principle is he teaching? The principle that as long as we love the Lord, the way we express our love for the Lord is what he accepts. Not our works, but the love that we show to God. And so Job, in James chapter 5, we are told that there's something we can learn from him. The hupomone of Job, or the patience or endurance of Job. That's something brought forth in James chapter 5 as an example to us. And so today we're going to look at, uh, not the book of Job, but we're going to look at the patience of Job. The patience of Job. And learn some lessons from him. And uh, what we're going to see here in the book of Job is how Job, did six things wrong and seven things right. And uh, some of the points are connected. And we want to see where he went wrong and where he went right in the end. So let's look at the book of Job and uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Job. Six things he did wrong, but seven things he did right. It began the story in Job chapter 1 before the test and the trial started. It says there in Job chapter 1 verse 1 that there was a man in the land of Uz. I like that land, right? All you need to do is change the U to an O and that would be Australia. <laughs> so there was a man in the land of Oz and uh, the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons, three daughters were born to him. And of course, you probably know all his goods by now. And his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. If you realize, Job lived about 140 years. So he was pre-Abrahamic. And uh, in those days, uh, after the flood, there was a, and after the days of Pelag, when the people's lifespan were about 200 to about 100 plus. That was the time scale that he lived in, pre-Abrahamic days. And uh, we are told here in verse 4, his sons would go out and feast in their houses each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning, 
and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So remember, he had seven sons, three daughters. So he offered ten to cover all of his children. Uh, and it tells us uh, how often he, do, he does it. It says, at the end of those feasts, uh, he would rise in the morning and Job says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. Regularly he did it. Uh, and of course, his sons were old enough, seven sons, uh, to go around by themselves. And you can imagine how long, how many years he has been doing that. Ever since his son learned how to party. He has been doing that very regularly. That is the first point. The first point in what Job did wrong, which is also a first point in what Job did right. You say, how can two points be right and wrong? See, look at his dedication, his devotion. That is something to be admired. I mean, this man is consistent, very consistent in what he does. That's something to be admired. But there was also something wrong in that prayer. He focused on the negative. Every time he prayed, it was just negative. See, how can it be negative? See, he was more motivated out of a fear lest his sons sin against God. So in a sense, that was what I call uh, the, the first problem that he had was the quality of his prayer. The quality of his prayer was just slightly out of sync. It would be the same way when you bring a child up in the Lord. Of course, I believe that children do need discipline according to uh, the extent of, uh, uh, of their rebellion or the, the discipline that they need in God. But even when you bring up children, you cannot focus just on their negative. It will do some damage to them internally. If always day and night you focus on all the things and imagine that every day you sit down with your son or sit down with your daughter and say, okay, let's go through. What sins have you done today? It's a terrible relationship. Your only father and daughter, father and son talk, the only mother and son or mother and daughter talk you have is let's see what sins you're forgiven and let's pray to God for forgive your sins. It's almost like he expects the children to sin. So the quality of his prayer was not there as it should be. At the same time, that is also a positive point, number one there, for he was dedicated. I mean, at least he did something. He did do his best in sincerity. He sincerely prayed for them. But one can be sincerely wrong. The approach can be wrong. You can say you love your child and you're doing this because you love them. But the end never justifies the means. Just because you love them doesn't mean you can use any method you want. There's always a right way and a wrong way. So here, the problem with Job was the quality of his prayer. The quality of his prayer is always focused on the negative. Let me give an example in modern day. Sometimes in modern days, people pray the wrong type of prayer to God. Maybe they are praying for uh, the unsafe husband or the unsafe wife or the unsafe children. And then they come to God and they come to God and say, Oh God, do whatever you need to save them. If you got to uh, break their leg, break their legs. <laughs> and uh, you got to take everything away, strip them completely, do so. Whoa, I don't think you're praying to the right God. Say, what happens when you start keep praying that way? God won't be the one. Later we see the other point who answer those kinds of prayer because God is not in the business of breaking legs. God is in the healing business. He is not in the breaking leg business. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to heal 
He didn't say Jesus came to send sickness. And so, Job is always focus, focus, uh, focusing, uh, focusing on the fact that, oh God, my children have sinned, please forgive their sin. Oh God, my children have sinned, maybe, maybe they have cursed you in that way. Forgive them, oh Lord, forgive them. He's always fo- uh, focusing on those areas. Why didn't he focus on what they can be instead of what they could have done wrong? That's a little bit on the negative side. And although he's a good man, we don't question his goodness. We don't question his sincerity. He's slightly on the negative side. Yes, indeed. Good people can be negative. And their motives could be right. But they're focused on the negative side. And that is a flaw that we need to recognize in Job's life. He's focused a little bit on the negative, which is why in the trial, he didn't quite, in the testing, in the whole book of Job, he didn't quite go, go through it 100% perfectly. Because at the end, he had to repent. So there is something too, something we can learn from his life, something we can learn from his mistakes. The right way to pray for your children is not, looking at what they could be doing wrong. The right way to pray for your unsafe husband or unsafe loved ones or wife is not to focus on, oh God, maybe right now they could be sinning, they could be doing all the sin. Oh God, please forgive all their sin. You're always focusing on their sin. How about praying for what they can be like? Or you could pray, oh God, you know, uh, turn, turn, turn that, that unsafe husband who's going around all over, turn him into a prophet. You might regret the day God answered that prayer. It comes from prophesying every night. And you say, oh God, please stop me in prophesying. And God says, which one do you want? So, focus on what the Lord wants in the person, the positive side. And that would be the correct way to pray. We should learn from Paul. Look at Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3. Look at his prayers. He never prayed negative for the Ephesians. He didn't say, you know, oh, you efficient, I don't know what else you have done wrong. <laughs> you know, I pray that God forgive all your terrible sins. <laughs> no, he prayed and he said, may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know the hope of your calling, the riches of his inheritance in the same, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards you. All very positive. Even the Corinthians, when Paul had to say a little prayer for them, he didn't focus on all their backslidden, all their strife, and all those terrible things that he had to write and correct them. When he prayed for them, he says, I thank God for you. Say, did he pray like that? Yes. He, he gave them best wishes. And the way he acknowledged them and uh, speak about all the things, it looks like, wow, this is a fantastic church to be in. If only you knew what the Corinthians were like. And Paul tells us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, remember, we all know what the Corinthian church was like. The people were quarreling. You know, some will say, I'm Apollos. And then some say, oh, I am Barnabas. And others say, oh, I'm Silas. And others say, hi, all of you follow men. I'm of Jesus. All fighting in the church. Plus, in the Lord's Supper, when they have communion, everyone's snatching their food. A lot of fighting. And then there, was, there were the women in the Corinthian, and uh, they always interrupt all the sermons. And Paul had to say, keep quiet. <laughs> And so all kinds of things are happening and you would think that Paul would focus on the negative and say, oh God, you know, please convert these backslidden buzzards. <laughs> Instead, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says in uh, verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you. Wow. This Paul really positive. I thank my God concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful prayer. And then after praying a nice, beautiful prayer, he scolded them. <laughs> he corrected and he scolded them. And that's all right. It's good to, to, to correct, to discipline. But when he prayed for them, he prayed for God's best. That is an example of how to pray. 
So what Job could have done, we admire him. He, the point one negative was because the quality of his prayer was towards a negative. He did not pray the word. He prayed the problem. There's a difference between praying the word and praying the problem. Praying the problem is always coming to God and say, Oh God, help my doubts. Oh God, help me, I'm in debt. Oh God, help me, I'm in debt. Oh God, look at all my debt. And you spend about 45 minutes describing all your problems. God is only going to answer our prayers based on His Word. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we must pray the Word. We must know what the Word says about our situation. So instead of praying that way, you say, Oh God, I thank you that your Word promises this. Your Word says you supply all our needs according to your riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Oh Lord, thank you that, that you are a provider. Thank you, your Word says that if we seek your kingdom first and, and your righteousness, all these things are added unto us. And you pray the Word and you confess the Word and you pray the Word and say all those things. At the end of it, you say, Oh God, and your Word says that if I love you, all things work together for good to those who love you. And all those things, you pray the Word, the Word, the Word, and then you say, Oh God, I thank you and I, as I see you, all my situations are very, very small. I commit all my problems to you. And I thank you, you're God of the word. It's all done. Let your will be done and not mine. That would be a positive word prayer. So you're praying the word, not praying the problem. Of course, in Job's time, they don't have much of the word. So he was praying the problem. On the other hand, that point one, we have to admire him. That man was consistent. That part, we have to give him some credit. He consistently covered the children and said, Oh God, forgive them. Oh God, if they've done all these things, if they done all, he was consistent, and that consistency is a point one plus for him too. At least he did it. Some other people wouldn't even care. At least he consistently, day after day, was there covering them. He was doing his best with the knowledge that he had, that he could in his prayer life. So that point one, we have to admire his consistency. That's a good point. Something we can learn from Job. That, uh, see, all the time God is not looking for perfection. If God were looking for perfection, we are all gone. None of us would qualify. All the time God is looking for is just our sincere little effort that we show. This is how we love him. That's all God is interested in. And let our love and our efforts that we show Him our love be consistent. There's something about consistent love. Not a love that is wishy-washy. A love that is constantly coming to God because He does love God. You know why He's asking for God to forgive His Son? Because He did not want God to be displeased. He did have an admiration and a love for God such that he didn't want God to be displeased. So that we need to give him the credit. He did something good also at the same time. Point number two that we see is Job chapter 1, verse 21, when the first trial hit. Because we all know the story, uh, he lost everything. He lost everything. All his 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys, very large household, and uh, even his sons and daughters. I mean, that man lost everything in one day. This is worse than a stock market crash. Stock market crash not so personal. Of course, it only affects you personally if you've got investments there. But here... He lost seven sons, three daughters. That's very personal. And uh, it says in verse 20, he arose, tore his robe, shaved his head. Bota. I mean, if you lose your son's daughters, what for you want any more hair? <laughs> I mean, nothing, nothing, nothing matters anymore. So he really was grieving. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Inside verse 21, 
is the number two thing Job did wrong. And the number two thing that Job also did right. Strange, isn't it? He did right and wrong at the same time. What did he do wrong in point two? Is that he attributed something that the devil did to God. We all know that it was God who allowed the test. But it was the devil who personally did. It was the devil who was coming after him. And it was not God who actually took it away personally. It was the devil who did all those destruction, destructive things. The devil was the one responsible and not God. So, strictly speaking, it was not the Lord taker. It would have been the Lord allowed to be taken. And that would be a different theology. Because to say the Lord take is to imply the Lord was involved in killing all these things. Killing his sons, taking away all these things in destruction. There's a, there's a slight difference in that. Now, you remember, you say, how can the Lord allow? Well, very clever. Now you sound like Job. How can the Lord allow? Remember what we say originally? Who was the one preventing all the destruction? God. God was preventing the world from being destroyed. And it's not so much, it is not so much as God sort of uh, personally allowing as God choose what to protect, what not to protect. Remember, there was a hedge around Job. And also remember that based on the law, everyone would have been destroyed. So without God, destruction would have happened anyway. Without God, there wouldn't have been the hedge around Job. Destruction would have happened anyway. It was God who was actually shielding. And so if God takes away the shield for a while, it actually was back to normal. You see, the abnormal was God protecting. Remember that. The normal as reaping what they sow would have been worse. It would be a hard life for everybody on this planet Earth. But it was God who was, quote unquote, if I use the word abnormal more in a context, that he saw people who loved him and he did a bit extra for them. To do things for them. See, God is a God without favoritism. Wherever in the world his eyes run to and fro, all who love the Lord, whether even some of them actually came to know Christ yet or not, because some people out there in the world, they haven't come to Christ yet, they do have a love for God in their own way. God works based on that love. And God, of course, will work based on those who come to know Christ, who love God even more. Of course, God will, will work, have the ability to work even more. Uh, remember that, uh, uh, let's say, you didn't know me, uh, let's say David, uh, the story of David and, um, let's illustrate with David. David and uh, uh, Abigail and Nabal. Uh, Nabal was married to Abigail. And Nabal was a very rich man. Probably some sort of farmer somewhere. David had run away from King Saul. He was hiding out in the wilderness. And so David out in the wilderness, he protected the farmers from all the uh, uh, people who come, the vagabonds and the thieves and all that, come and go and destroy. And so David, at a certain point, who had been protecting all the farm, Nabal didn't ask him. But since he was there, David just protected and shielded. And so David, at one, at one time, they, they came to ask for some sort of present, and Nabal sort of cursed David and said the wrong thing. And David was going to come and destroy Nabal, and Abigail interceded and stopped that. Later, that uh, uh, sometime later, Nabal died. And then David married Abigail. That was the story in the Old Testament. But the fact here is was 
like the servants of Abigail came and, uh, came and tell, tell her and said that because of David and his men, they didn't lose any of the sheep. A lot of the things were protected. So to a certain extent, David was there behind the scene protecting. And it's the same way, let's say like uh, uh, you live in a dangerous place, let's say. Let's say outside Singapore, let's say you live in a dangerous place where every other day some things get stolen. Your shoes, your bicycle, your doorknobs, or whatever. And it so happened that uh, 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 I was there and, and let's say pretend that I've always been preventing the crimes from take, coming to your place. So you live there for one year, wow, no doorknobs stolen, no shoes stolen, no bicycles stolen. He said, wow, how blessed you are, but you didn't know it was me guarding you. Then one fine day, I decided to go and leave for seven days. And then suddenly, you lost your doorknob, your bicycle, and four pairs of shoes. He <laughs> said, ah, who did it, you know? And then suddenly, you come and blame me, and you say, hey, you know, you know, do you do all those things? Why do you allow this thing? I said, in the first place, if I was not there, it would have happened anyway. You see the point of the reverse picture. God was all the time preventing those things anyway. Do you know that God had a right to take his hand off and just let the whole world sink? God had a right to just take his hand off. I mean, talk about reaping what they sow. Men sin, you know, reap what they sow, let it, let it go. When should God be protecting? You know, and then men there want to argue. Oh God, you know, you know, we have been righteous. We reap righteousness. God say, oh, you're talking about your righteousness? How much can your righteousness do? Your righteousness can only save you maybe half a sheep. <laughs> See, God, God was not obligated to even protect. Yet he did it because he loved them. So if God should choose to just withdraw a little bit, none of us can say anything. Which was what Job found out. And so that was the picture behind the Lord gave, the Lord take it. The Lord just said, all right, since the devil is challenging and seeing this Job character, is such that he is only loving me because I protected him. That was a challenge, and that was a big challenge to God. And God was confident of his Job. He didn't know that his Job, with a lot of hair, would become bought out through the trial. <laughs> and so, when uh, God says, all right, I will just let you do that to see what happens, to see... Because God needs to give a chance. And so he just withdraw a little bit of his protection. That's all God did. It's called in Hebrew the permissive tense. Anytime you say God did, God that, God did all this, it's God permitted. And you'll find the story of the Chronicles and also Kings. When you talk about King Saul when he died, and uh, at some point in the records of Chronicles, it said God killed him. But God didn't kill him, and Amalekite killed him. Fall, fall on his sword and try to commit suicide, but didn't succeed. Later on, Amalekite finished him off. But it says God killed him. But the story record, it was Amalekite who actually killed him after he first tried to commit suicide unsuccessfully. But the records of the Bible are like summary. So remember, it's permissive tense. God permits. Because he just sometimes wants to test, he sometimes wants to watch, just like he permits Jesus to be tempted by the devil. Not because he didn't love Jesus, but it was part of the testing. And so God just withdraw. And Job, who could not see that the devil did all those things, in a sense, this is the number two thing he did wrong. He attribute that God was actively doing this to him. See, in the Old Testament, uh, in the first problem with Job was the quality of his prayer. The second problem with Job was his understanding of God and the devil. Of course, in those days, they did not know that the devil was behind all their problems. When Jesus came, he exposed the devil, which many people don't see that the devil is behind a lot of problems. We know because in the book of Revelations, when the devil is uh, bound for 1,000 years, suddenly the world has no more evil. Peace on earth. So we know how much trouble he is behind all those things. 
And you look at the Sabians and all those things, doing all those things. Behind it, Satan was putting thoughts of robbing and killing people. So behind it was all the devil because there was only one devil and there were so many bad things happen. So it's amazing that indirectly it was the devil. And Job number two problem was that he attributed all the evil to God. Doesn't look good on God doesn't look good on God at all. And we humans tend to do that when we have a narrow, narrow vision and view. We don't see the beginning, how God created the earth and how man chose his way. And we don't see the ending of how much God is trying to reach out and save us from all the evil of ourselves and the devil. And we only see that narrow vision of our own personal life and we don't see God helping us and then we blame God. And that was a tunnel vision like what Job saw. He didn't see the devil. He attributed everything to God personally. God does not appreciate you thanking Him for all the things He never did. But today, humans do that. When a tornado sweeps through the whole place, they say, an act of God. All the bad things, an act of God. Yeah, how come every day you wake up, the sunshine shining, you didn't say, wow, an act of God. Yeah, tornado come, kill everybody. <laughs> Wipe through 1,000 homes. An act of God. Which God? The one with a small G. Name spell devil. That was the one behind it. All the destruction and evil of the world, we need to recognize that Jesus said very clearly in John chapter 10, verse 10, the devil steal, kill, and destroy. Acts 10, verse 38, the devil is the one who oppressed people. This understanding we must have. Job didn't have it, and part of the time, he's not really to be blamed because the knowledge was not there. But lest any one of us look at Job, and then we also follow him without realizing the New Testament is Old Testament. So New Testament is different, which is why in a New Testament, our understanding, our understanding must be different. So although point number two didn't look, his understanding was flawed. His theology was flawed. And God bless people even with flawed theology. Oh yes, yes, some preachers go out preaching who don't know the Bible. Preach how, you know, oh, how Paul was preaching and then uh, his wife Silas uh, was going around, around and trying to do God's work. And his son Timothy was just crying on the street. And uh, come and uh, get born again. And people can't get born again. <laughs> Even though Silas was not his wife, Timothy was not his real son. <laughs> all the theology all over the place, but God still used that. So God bless us. Even our theology is imperfect. Our doctrine is imperfect, inaccurate. God still blesses it. But that doesn't excuse us from imperfect theology. To have put more, more greater understanding is always better because then we can see who God is in a clearer picture. Theology is supposed to be an understanding of God. And so he did not have perfect understanding. However, in Job 1.21, the second good point about Job is also found there. At least, at least he recognized in his relationship with God, he recognized that everything belonged to God. You see, there's a positive point spin to the bad negative point. You know people who say, oh, everything God, everything God, God did this, God did that. Then the positive spin on that is that they also recognize and they surrender, well, God, let it be. You know, I accept anything from you. That's quite good of him in verse 21. Look at uh, Job chapter 1, verse 21. That's, that's not too bad an attitude that he had, which we got to put in as a positive point also in verse 21. He says, naked I came from the, my mother's womb, naked I shall, I, I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord take away. And then he says, blessed be, the, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's something to be admired. Something to be admired. Because we know a lot of faith people who have the understanding that the devil caused all their problem. God is a good God. The devil is a bad devil. And all the bad things happen from, because of the devil. All the good things happen because of God. And then they go to test, trial, and temptation. Their mouth still 
couldn't even say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And the most it come out is silence. Cannot say anything. At least Job could say, blessed be the name of the Lord. There is a surrenderedness that he, he has there, a positive point even in that, that understanding. Because as far as Job was concerned, everything belonged to God. He never took it that it was his in that sense. He could just let go as easily as he held on. He was not tied to his possessions. He was not tied to the worldly things. He easily let go and he says, even if he leave the world naked and empty, so be it. He will still bless the Lord. That's a point to be admired. A great point to be admired. He's willing to surrender all. In the second positive point of Job in that verse is he was a surrendered man. He was absolutely surrendered. If God takes everything, he still says, you are my God. He did not walk away from God. He will serve God whether God heal him or not. He will serve God whether God give him prosperity or not. He will serve God whether his life was easy or not. Not like a lot of Christians we know. Who will not serve God unless they get healed. Who will not serve God unless they're prosperous. Who will not serve God unless life is a bed of roses. But for Job, whether his life was easy or hard, and this was a hard time he was going through, he says, I will still bless my God. God was still his God. That has to be a positive point too that we can admire from Job and learn from him. Third point that we have here in the uh, book of Job, and that derived from his understanding. And here's where we begin to diverge a little bit. In uh, Job chapter 2, when the second incident happened, where this time Satan put sickness upon Job, and Satan was allowed to strike Job with painful balls in chapter 2, verse 7. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he was allowed to do that. Just for a moment of time. And uh, Job was suffering. And then in verse 9, his wife came to him. And don't, don't forget, his wife also suffered. Because the 7,000 sheep, 3,000 donkeys, and 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, seven sons and three daughters were also hers. Mrs. Job also suffered. So Mrs. Job, just a bit more emotional than Job. A tiny little bit. Yeah, let's give her a little bit. And Job, he just, mom, he just cannot say anything. Silent. No. Before he was sick, he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. And after blessing the Lord, the next few days he got boils. <laughs> Things doesn't look better. It looks worse. And if you got balls, also very hard to talk. You know, anyone you got mums before, try to talk. Very hard. And mums is only one side bunga. Think about balls all over the place. So imagine he if he wants to say blessed be the name of the Lord and the past flowing out of his thing, very hard to talk. The wife who surprisingly was not sick. Yeah, how come the wife never got it? Yeah. And yet Job, he got sick. And the wife, at least she got her help. So she was a very healthy woman, dressed nicely, uh, probably a high society lady. Lipstick, lots of makeup, <laughs> nicely dressed, comes to Job. And here is Job all in wretches, uh, in, 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 his, in his filthy clothes, full of pus and balls, and she's so beautiful looking. And, it, and he says, Job, Mrs. Job says to Mr. Job, curse God and die. <laughs> She doesn't even have any balls. Maybe God should have shared some balls with her. 
Mr. Jones will say, my dear, come near, come near, sit next to me, let's share our boils together. <laughs> At least Mr. Job, while he was having all these painful boils, says, you know, and he scolded her and says, uh, hey, you speak like one of the foolish women, you know. And here he says, shouldn't we accept good from God? Should not we accept adversity? And he says, Job did not sin with his lips. That's to his credit. He never cursed God. He never cursed God. He, he never said something bad about God. There is some sort of relationship and love yet. You know, not to say bad about somebody shows some love. If you love someone, you find it hard to tolerate not only you saying bad to them, but other people saying bad about them if you really love that somebody. Because you can't stand it. Because when, they, when, you, when somebody hurts someone you love, you feel it. How would you like someone saying bad things about your children? Of course you feel it. Because you love your children. And Job must have certain love for God to say, he will not say something bad about God. He did not curse God. He will not curse God. That's the third good point about Job. He did not curse God at all. He was, at least he held his tongue. But at the same time, the third point, in another manner, where Job was already, he not only had boils, don't forget he lost 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys, 7 sons, and, and uh, three daughters, and his uh, beautifully make up wife was there telling him, curse God and die. He not only has boils, he must be boiling inside. <laughs> boiling inside. You know, just had to say something. You know, in his sorrow, in his pain, in his misery. If anybody could have comforted him, it was Mrs. Job. But Mrs. Job was not going to comfort him. She instead became... Prophetic. <laughs> Discomfort her. <laughs> Sorry, prophets. Right. They did say that prophets, you know, um, uh, yeah, afflict the comfortable and, and the pastors comfort the afflicted. <laughs> anyway, so she was afflicting him mentally. Job was boiling. And that's the third thing he did wrong. He don't dare to curse God. He had enough respect and love for God, which is a good point for Job. Very good of you, Job. But you know what Job did? He cursed himself. He cursed himself. Look at Job chapter 3. He cursed the day he was born. Oh, I'll tell you, this Job really miserable. In verse 1 and 2, he says, May the day perish when I was born. All because of a trial. Isn't it? Isn't it remarkable? Job's trial lasted less than a year. Six months to a year. Before this trial, I don't know how old he was at this time. If he had seven sons, three daughters, and he accumulated so much wealth, give and take, maybe if he was young, in his 50s or 60s. If he was older, maybe in his 70s or 80s. Don't forget, he lived here 140 years. So for that time, 70 years, young man, halfway. You know, 70 is middle age. And so, maybe he was in his 70s. Can you imagine? Just over a period of a few days to a week or so, everything that he had enjoyed in life, he couldn't see as an enjoyment. He cursed his whole life. Say, but Job, what about the good times you had with your seven sons, three daughters? Remember when they were first born, you held them to yourself, how you nursed them and you cared for them. Remember how you took care when you first had your 1,000 sheep and then it multiplied to 7,000? Don't you thankful to God and your house and your goods and your servant? All these nice things in life, all forgotten in one day of misery. Life is so fragile. You thought you have everything. 
until the boy who struck you. And then suddenly you wish you were dead. This was what Job was like in his trial. And uh, so Job started to curse himself. And, uh, and he had complaints and he cursed himself. And in verse 26, he also says in verse 25, 26, the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. So he's, he began to reveal all his fear that was inside him all the time. So this third point that, of course, the faith people have emphasized only on that one point, that we put as one of the six points, that Job didn't do that well. And you know why? It is wrong to curse even the creation. Remember what Jesus said about ourselves. You cannot even make, you know, one of your little ha hair on your head grow. It's all gone. It says you shall not swear by yourself. You shall not swear by the earth is the, is the Lord's footstool. You shall not swear by the heaven because it's the Lord's throne. You cannot even swear by yourself because you are made by God. And Job ended up cursing himself, which was not a good thing. He just wanted to let out his frustration somewhere. So he looked to God. You cannot use God as a punching bag, dangerous. You punch God, he'll give you just a tiny punch, you're dead. <laughs> he looks around. His wife, wrong to punch the wife, you know, the wife said, curse God and die, you know. <laughs> say, no, no, cannot, you know, cannot do violence at home. <laughs> and so, then he looks at himself in the mirror, okay, this guy who's in the mirror now, <laughs> that looks punchable, you know. So he started cursing all in himself. That was not good, that was not good. Job was going downhill from the earlier. Not so good. Well, we might as well finish all the other six points that he had wrong before we go to the others because here's where it diverged into two different angles. Fourth thing that Job did wrong, he complained. See, the reason we have to point to Job so that we know that when you read the Job, book of Job, you've got to compare what New Testament people are supposed to do. We are different. In Job chapter 6, Job basically complained. Job 6, verse 1, Job said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid with it on line scales. And uh, in verse 8, Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for, that it will please God to crush me, that he will lose his hand and cut me off. Wow, he's really... Uh, all these words are because of the point two where he go and attribute all the evil to God. You see, theology is such, when you build the foundation wrong, your third level is wrong. Your fourth level is wrong. If your second level is wrong. So one build on another. So because he accepted the fact that there was no devil and everything came from God, so he started blaming God and talking about things that God never did. And he basically was complaining. Uh, chapter 23, he is still complaining and his friends, of course, were there. In verse 1 and 2, Job answered and said, Even today, my complaint is bitter. See, he's still complaining. That's the fourth thing that Job didn't do right. He complained. You see, but shouldn't we complain in test trials and temptation? The purpose for this teaching is so that we don't complain. Because the people in the Bible who complain all died. Job nearly died. <laughs> you remember the Israelites who came out? They were not famous, but infamous for one thing. Complain, 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 complain. Mixed multitude. Always complaining. When they reached cross, just after crossing the Red Sea, they were just dancing and rejoicing, you know. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. Dancing, the tambourine, all the things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cross and they say, hey, no food to eat. <laughs> no water to drink. Complain, 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 complain. <laughs> all complaining all the time. And God has to give them manna, bring meat in the evening, and bring water out the rock. Oh, God really nursed them. And after God nursed them, also they say, manna not enough. 
They, remember, they got meat in the evening. They say, we want meat, morning and evening. This man are too boring. Complain, 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 complain. Until in the book of Numbers, they complain so much fire came out. <laughs> too much complaining. Ten times they were complaining. So Job, point number four, he was a complainer. He really complained to God. And he did not do what we New Testament should do differently. So we are different from Job. In the New Testament, it says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says here, in a tiny little obscure place, it says in verse 18, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. It didn't say, for everything, because not everything is caused by God. But it did say in everything, which includes in every situation. Give thanks to God. This is a New Testament approach where Job did not have the revelation. So New Testament people are different. Because we are born again. And if test, trials, and tribulations hit us, the only thing that comes out from us is, praise you, Lord. That's why I say, sometimes, hallelujah. Sometimes, praise the Lord. Sometimes, at least, only singing. <laughs> Still surviving. No complaint yet, only singing. But didn't complain yet. The Bible says so many times, and Hebrews also tells us that in Hebrews chapter 13, that we to offer to God the sacrifice of praise. And one of the things that 1 Peter calls us is we are a people of praise, a people of worship. So that whatever the devil throws at us, we praise the Lord. You remember at the beginning of the charismatic movement, one thing was very powerful. Praise the Lord. Every corner you go to, you know what charismatic are. You go around the corner, you're eating a coffee, and you hear the other corner, praise the Lord. I said, that's charismatic. <laughs> so everybody go, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you know. And of course, in those days, they, some of them do minutes, some of them automatic. <laughs> Anything happen, praise the Lord, you know. They drive the car, you know, slight, slight, slight accident, praise the Lord, <laughs> you know. You know, and sometimes the praise of the Lord come at the wrong time. You know, someone sharing their testimony or how their sister died out from the floor say, Praise the Lord! <laughs> so, you know, everybody praise the Lord. We, we need to be a bit sensitive to, you know, don't the, all, everything, praise the Lord. And somebody say, Oh, I visited the hospital, 10 people died. Praise the Lord! <laughs> okay, we need to be discreet a bit when we say praise the Lord. And, uh, but in our heart, we still give thanks. And here's a reason. Romans 8, 28. If we know that if we love God, all things will work together for good, then the place to start is, thank you, Lord. In everything, give thanks. And as we begin to thank the Lord, oh Lord, no matter what happens, I will not allow my lips to complain. I won't be like Job. I learned from the lesson of Job. But we will say, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Sometimes it's not easy. And uh, there was a worship leader long, long ago. His name is Terry Law. And uh, uh, it tells how uh, as his ministry was taking off, uh, one day he lost his wife and children, I think, to an accident. And he was out in ministry. And when he found that they all died, he felt at first being human, he felt very bitter. So it's very bitter. Sorrow is bitter. And he felt like, why didn't God protect? Why didn't God do all those things? But because he was a worshiper, as he went into a place of prayer, in his testimony, in his book by Terry Law on praise and worship, and he said, in the end, God began to deal with his life. He said, son, would you still love me and worship me? And you think about it. If some things have happened, remember, we don't know the cause of everything. Not all causes are personal. 
Some are just out there, beyond personal causes. But whatever situation happens, think about it. How does your complaining change things? Read the book of Job. The complaining didn't do anything better. Didn't make things better. And then take a little bit, bit further in the Old Testament, read the book of Exodus and Numbers, and show the complaining actually makes it worse. So in both situations, complaining never adds anything to the improvement in the situation. It makes you feel worse. It makes others around you feel worse. And worse still, it cut off the only help you can, which is God. And so Terry Law struggled through that, and he was sharing his testimony. It was in early days with charismatic. I don't know where he is today. And he said, at first he was bitter, hurt, and cried. And then as he cried bitter tears, something inside him said, I will still praise the Lord. And then he chose to praise the Lord. He chose to give thanks to the Lord. And through that was born a ministry. In fact, he was one of the few ministries who knew the present Pope. And, was give, and the present Pope before he became a Pope. And he was given letters to open doors to places that others did not have. God still continue in that time. I don't know where he is today, but he used him. But it was a beautiful story in that. Don Moyen, who wrote the song, God Will Make a Way, tells us the story of how that song came about. See, one of his friends lost, uh, the parents died in an accident. Sometimes it can be natural cause, don't forget. And left just the children, young kids. They were Christian, born again. When he heard that happen to his close friend, he didn't know what to say. Didn't know what to do. And as he went to cry and weep and pray, God gave him this song. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways you cannot see. He will make a way for me. Have you noticed that some of the most beautiful songs, some of the most touching sentences, some of the greatest poetry comes from the deepest sorrow. Sometimes the blackest sorrow are the best fertilizer for the next flower. And we cannot sometimes understand, which we will touch in this series, the pain, the sorrow that humans go through. But sometimes the only way for us when we've gone through earth to enjoy heaven is to understand what sorrow is in. Sometimes the only way you can understand pleasure is to understand pain. Sometimes the only way to enjoy great joy is to understand great sorrow. And sometimes remember like the woman in the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, Mark chapter, chapter 14. Jesus was in the house of Simon the leper, the Pharisee who got healed probably. The Pharisee had everything in life. He had a good life, except that he had leprosy, which probably Jesus healed him. He was probably upper middle class. He had never been in a down and out and low places in society. Reasonably good life. He had Jesus as his honored guest. But there was a woman who was a former prostitute, who had seen the worst of life, the lowest of society, who had sold her body because she probably was in need who had not known what it was to be loved, who had nothing in life to live for. And she was there washing Jesus' feet with her tears. And Jesus asked Simon, who do you think loves me? After telling a parable. And Simon says, he who is forgiven more loves me. 
And so that woman loved Jesus more than Simon. How strange that life can be. That in, take a photo picture of that incident. There was Jesus sitting in an honored place. There was Simon who owns the house and the whole place, a rich man. There was the poor woman who sold everything she had, 300 denarii, to buy expensive ointment to anoint Jesus. She probably don't even own a house. Take a photo shot of that picture. If time were to stop still and every one of them died, that woman would have gone to a higher place in heaven than Simon. Because your position in heaven is measured, not based on your position in life. You could be a king or a, or a, a high society person, but in heaven, you are a pauper. You are as poor as one of those who just barely make it with no rewards. But you could be the outcast of society who don't even own a bank account who don't own a single property, who only has the clothes on your back, but you have so much love for Jesus, if everyone die, you go to a higher place than the other person. Isn't it strange what life is about? Because this life is about love. You are only rich when you are rich in love. Love for God and love for people. That's the true riches. And heaven is measured by the currency of love. That's the only currency heaven acknowledges. If you have love, you will grow near to the God of love. And that's why it's important whatever happens in life, let only love let only worship come from. Job, unfortunately, was still learning. Later he had to repent. He complained and complained. It didn't make matters better. His friends didn't make it better. But New Testament, in everything, give thanks. And we learn. And sometimes, God does allow people to go through more because more is required. Have you noticed that the same ability to taste pain is the same ability to taste pleasure? That the same ability to taste sorrow is the same ability to taste joy. That's why that woman in Mark 14 and Luke 7 she has tasted rejection. She has tasted sorrow. And when Jesus loved her, Jesus loved her and Jesus loved Simon the same. He's impartial. But she received more love because she knew Jesus knew everything. Simon may know, yes, Jesus knew, but she really knew Because she knows she didn't deserve that. So it's important for us to understand how to give thanks again. Let's go. The fifth and sixth thing that Job did that was wrong. In Job chapter 8, which I put it as a separate point, Job chapter 9, actually. In Job chapter 9, verse 17, Job says, He crushes me with a tempest. He multiplies my wounds without cause. Verse 17. And Job says in verse 21, I'm blameless, yet I do not know myself. I despise my life. You know what Job was saying? He was blaming God. 
it is so wrong to blame God. Now, Job 0.5 was because of 0.2. He taught that all evil came from God. If we haven't learned this lesson, that God is a good God. He never does evil. He, he, it might seem that He permits evil, but if He permits it, it's only for a short time, and He knows He can endure it. But He never does evil. Job blamed God for what he went through. He said God was the one wounding him and crushing him. That's not so true. In point six, of course, we all know that. In Job 27, verse 1 and verse 6, and also Job 35, verse 2, which uh, Elihu mentioned, Job was self-righteous. Job himself said, I'm righteous. Why should these things happen to me? As I mentioned, the world is already going downhill. Your self-righteousness does not save you from the consequences of living on a planet that was doomed. If a volcano explodes and you live near the volcano, your righteousness doesn't save you necessarily. The only thing that saves you is somehow perhaps when God sends two angels and take you outside the situation. But you remain in that situation, you still die. Important for us to know. Our righteousness does not save us. Job, problem six was his self-righteousness. We saw from the good point of Job that number one, at least he was consistent in his devotional life. Uh, that is verse five. Number two, at least he was surrendered to God in verse 21. Number three, he did not curse God. But he should have pushed number three to another level. Praise God which we can in the New Testament, he can't. Jesus didn't come yet. Point four, the good thing that Job did in Job 13, verse 15. This is a nice verse that Job said. Out of his despair, he says in verse 15, the first part is good, the second part not so good. He says, though he slay me, yet I will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my ways before him. The first part is the better part. Even though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That demonstrates that Job was prepared to die without cursing God. Because we need to go one better than Job. And that is, we are willing to lay our lives for Jesus. He is worth our life. And if we really love him, then he demands that we love him with our life. You know why when we asked a question earlier, God loves every one of us equally. But we cannot love God equally. Even sitting in this place, we don't love God equally. And those hearing this message might have different levels of love. You know why? There's something we all must do to love God equally. The question he asked Peter three times. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times in Gospel of John 21. Peter replied, I follow you, I follow you. Third time Jesus said, do you follow me? And he says, yes, I follow you. Why did Jesus ask that question? Partly to heal Peter, but behind it was this. After Peter had affirmed his love for Jesus, Jesus said, when you were young, you clothed yourself and you go where you want. But when you're old, someone will take you where you do not want to go. Implying, Peter, I want you to die for me. You say you love me. I want you to be prepared to die for me. See, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 3.16 says, No greater love has any man than that he lay down his life for any man. You know how much God loves us? Unto death. 
if we here today are prepared to say, God, I love you so much, I'm willing to die for you. If you ask me to lay down my life right now, I will. If we could say that sincerely with our heart, then your love can come to the same capacity as God. Because the Bible did say, no greater love can anyone show until they're willing to lay down their lives. So if we are willing to lay down our lives, that's the place to start. And we have to examine our heart. Is Jesus just your saviour? Or is Jesus your Lord and your God? Today, our concept of God is a God in a box that we put on a shelf. But you know what the concept of God is? He is God who owns everything. Is Jesus just our Savior? Or is He our Lord and our God? And when we can determine that indeed, he is worthy to die for. It is a place to start to know the meaning of what true love is. True love is when your love is selfless. You are willing to lay your life for another. And we are not asking you to do that for any other one yet, but for Jesus. For Jesus. It seems an easy question to answer, but not so easy when you have to wrestle with things in your heart. And you want to be able to answer sincerely to God, yes, I am. Because I know in New Zealand, we, uh, we, when we go there, we stay with a nice New Zealand, uh, half Maori, married to a Maori. And uh, when we first visited that house, he did not know Jesus yet, but the wife knew Jesus. But he was a very nice businessman, top-notch businessman, but dressed very simple. Typical uh, New Zealander, shorts and all those things. Um, but he owns a, a, a reasonable big business with many, many trucks, digging cables and all that. And uh, I ended up in his house because when we went to New Zealand, uh, it was a small uh, church, that uh, invited us and we didn't want to cost too much expenses. They want to put us in a hotel and I said, look, uh, just put me in any home. We have a guest room, it's quiet enough for me and I'm happy, no expense for you. So that's how I ended up in that home. So I choose not to go to the hotel but to go to the home. And so when we went there, they were hospitable and, um, and uh, since that time I've got acquainted with them. But he's a He's a, you know, you meet these rare people who your handshake means your word, the old time kind of business person. He means what he said, and he says, and he asked a lot of questions about Jesus. And one of the things that touched him was this. He says, the very fact that I choose to stay in a home and not in a hotel, that means something. He knows that Christ means a lot to me. That Christianity is not a game plan that you play. That it's real. You make decisions based on love. You make decisions based on care. You make decisions based on love for people, consideration. And he, of course, he saw my life as I stay in his house. And uh, he asked me a lot of questions. And then he knew one thing. Jesus is very real to me, and I love Jesus very much. And then towards the end of the first day, he said, you know, one day I'm going to make Jesus my Savior. But when I do, I will really mean it with all my heart. But he's very honest and say, I'm not ready yet. But when I'm ready, it's 100% no turning back. And so I continued staying, went there a few times. And then one day, after a few stays, I heard, he has made his decision. But that's the kind of person 
So when he makes his decision, he means business. No turning back. He actually counts the cost. What it means to follow Christ. He followed Christ. So again I said, is Jesus our Saviour only or is He also our Lord? Sometimes it takes us sincerely a length of time to actually come to the point and say, Jesus, we really mean this. You are my Lord. And then He accepts us. Just like this businessman who took his time and then he made Jesus not just his Saviour, his Lord. The same way. I am now always, the guest room is mine. Anytime, day and night, whether ministry or not, to stay there. And I always stay there now. And it's important for us to know that there is a cost involved when we want to say, I'm willing to die for you. Because inside us, we know whether we really are. Whether we're saying with our lips. Remember, Peter tried it once. When Jesus said, before going to the cross, all of you will be, will, will be scattered. And all of you will, will, will run away. And then Peter, who did not know what he meant, says, all will run away by willing to die for you. Remember, he said that. And Jesus said, no. Before the cock crow twice, you deny me thrice. So, Jesus knew that when he just said, he was not realizing the cost. Because when you actually come to where the rubber hits the road, then you know how painful it is to pay the price. Because you will be tested on your commitment. Where you will have to choose. Okay, is Jesus Lord or is He not Lord? If He's Lord, I'm willing to take this risk. You will have to choose. But blessed be the day that you could do like Job and say, you're willing to die for me. Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. Even He put you to the death, you know there's a reason for it. That there's a better reason for it. Then your commitment and love for Jesus will grow by leaps and bounds. You know the woman who came to watch Jesus speak with her tears? I believe if Jesus had asked the woman or Simon and said, okay, both of you, would you all both right now be willing to die for me now? I would think Simon would probably think twice. Because he got his house, his goods, and all his business to consider. But that woman washing his feet with tears would have instantly say, yes, Lord, I'll die for you. There's something about the willingness to lay our lives for Jesus. To die for Him. Some say it's easier to die for Him than to live for Him. True. But unless you're willing to die for Him in your heart, you cannot really live for Him. That's why Jesus talks about being crucified with Him. To die to all our sin. That's the good thing that Job went through. That's what made him pass the test. And then in Job chapter 17, verse 1, the number 15 that Job, we can learn from Job. These are the good things. Job 17, verse 1. It says here, in our modern translation, it says, Job says, in verse 1, My spirit is broken. My days are extinguished. That's the fifth good thing that I consider. Job, became a broken man. We all need to be broken for God to use us. Bible did tells us that a broken and contrite spirit, God will not despise. And we need other verses on brokenness is Psalms 34, 18 and Psalms 51, 17, which tells us how good brokenness is in our life. That brokenness is the key to God's restoration in our life. However, we need to understand that that word brokenness in Job is from a different Hebrew word from the one in Psalm 34, 18. The one in Job 17, verse 1, is the word kabel in the Hebrew, C-H-A-B-A-L. Kabel means to be like, wind up. 
So Job was feeling his spirit wind up and squeeze. Where is the other word broken in Psalm 34, 18 and Psalms 51, 17 where a broken and contrite spirit, God will not despise, He will accept you and restore you. Is the, is the, the word broken is the word Shabbat. The word Shabbat means to be like broken down completely like a potter breaking in pieces to rebuild again. That's the good brokenness. And that is also different from the other brokenness which is in a merry heart do good like a medicine one in the one in Proverbs 17, 32 and uh, 22 and Proverbs 15, 13. A uh, merry heart do good, look, do good like medicine, a broken spirit dry the bones. Uh, that brokenness is a different one it's a brokenness called Nako Naka, N-A-K-E, N-A-K-A. And uh, that brokenness is more a brokenness of being wounded. So there are three types of brokenness. Job felt the squeezing brokenness, but not yet to the level of being broken down in pieces yet. And it's different from the one that is a wounded heart. Which, uh, uh, which is opposed to a merry heart. Uh, that the other one dried the bones. But however it come, whatever method it come, one thing we all know, in this life, we need brokenness. But not the wrong type of brokenness where our heart is wounded and never healed. Because that dryer the bones. And... Uh, Maybe some of us are like Job. The beginning of the brokenness is you feel yourself squeeze. But you're not yet broken yet. But Job was already crying almost in brokenness. I am broken. He felt himself breaking to pieces because the pressure was on him, squeezing him like a rope, winding around him. But that's a good thing. At least the pressure had begun. Because only through humility can we ascend. And only through brokenness can we understand love. Again, I illustrate the snapshot picture. Luke 7, Mark 14. Simon the leper sitting on the table in his house. Jesus is guest of honor. The woman at the feet of Jesus washing his feet with her tears. Ask you this question. Which one of them is broken? Of course the woman. The woman. She had no more self-respect in a sense. She was practically washing his feet with her tears, taking her hair and wiping his feet. She was nothing to herself. But Jesus has become Whereas Simon the leper, the Pharisee, was still dignified. He still had his home, his, all his protocol, all his servants. He has not tasted the brokenness of the woman. Out of great brokenness comes great love. Only when we have been broken, rejected, dejected, crushed, then we really know what true love is. Think about it. How do we illustrate and learn enduring love? Except that you'll be put in a situation where you've got to endure. You read sometimes of normal love stories that are touching. Sometimes it comes out in the Real Digest, sometimes in places here and there. And one time in the Real Digest, it talks about how uh, one, I, let me remember co correctly, a, I think it was a Vietnamese man who loved a North Korean woman. And they separated for years and years and years by governments and politics. And by the time they met each other, they were very old, but they were still in love. And they finally married. Don't you think that's a beautiful story? But, thinking about what their love went through. Or long, long ago, there was this story, a true story, Real Digest. 
about an arranged marriage. And in this arranged marriage, the husband didn't really love the wife. So he's always you know, pulling, pu putting her down, despising her, treating her badly, and all the time treat her like a servant more than like a wife. Always doing all the nasty things to her. He didn't love her a bit. So he just married because he had to. And one day when he suffered certain sickness and everything, and then he lost uh, sight of his eyes, and there was an operation. And then he found that the one who gave him the eye was the wife whom he had despised all his life. Because when he woke up and he opened his eyes and saw that he could have been blind, he saw the wife whom he was forced to marry, whom he has despised for decades and years and years, in spite of all the hatred and they put her through suffering, when he had a need, she gave her eye to him. So when he woke up, and he saw his wife without one eye. He knew. And the story in Real Digest says, he wept, he asked for her forgiveness, and I gather he loved her the rest of his life. These are beautiful human stories of love. And there are human stories of great love out there. We do know that. Even in this world where there's so much divorce and broken marriages, there are still stories of great love. How much more? Because all this human love comes as a picture of the original love from God. How much more the love of God to us that we need to understand that sometimes True love can only come through test, trial, and temptation. Otherwise, how is your love tested? Think about it. How else will love be tested? If it's always on the bed of roses, if there's no suffering, if you love each other only because you got money, but then when you love each other, even though you had nothing, that's a death. If you only love each other because you're both pretty and healthy, but when one is sick and one still love, that's when the love is tested. Think about it. How can love be tested except by test, trial, and tribulation? That is why this planet was designed and permitted to have the devil run wild to a certain extent. We got time for that too. So that only on this earth can we learn the lessons of love that we will never learn in heaven. That's why angels in heaven look down on this planet. Some of you may be suffering. Some of you may be tested. Some of you may be in situations where you're crying out in pain, in grief. Maybe physical pain, but let me tell you, soul pain is as painful. Mental torment is as painful, if not even more. Emotional pain is so much greater sometimes where there's no relief and no medicine that you can put on. But in all your pain, remember this. If you still can love God, if you still can love people, if you still can release forgiveness, then your love is worth the test. The quality of your love is worth more than gold and silver. And that was the sixth and seventh point that we touched on, that Job did right. Fifth was broken spirit. Sixth was Job repented in Job 42 verse 5. Job repented. That was a good thing. He knew how to say he's sorry and when he's wrong. He held his mouth and he said, I now repent. 
And so in Job 42, verse 5, he repented. But Job 42, verse 10 is where we want to conclude, based on where we are talking today. Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friend. I want you to notice that verse. That's the seven point. Six point, Job repent. Seven point, Job forgive. The true exercise of unconditional love is when you forgive people. That's why the Lord put it in the Lord's prayer. That's why the Lord put it in the Mark 11, in the passage on faith. That's why the Lord Jesus put it when he talked about moving heaven and earth in Matthew 18. Because forgiveness is love flowing out. Unconditional love. And if you notice carefully, God restored Job only when he prayed for his friend. Not before. All these friends who caused him misery, all these friends who misunderstood him, all his friends who, who, who assigned blame and sin and the wrong things against him. At the end of the whole story, Job had to forgive his friend and pray for him. What happened if Job did not forgive his friend? Job would not be restored. You know, through all his trials, he need to find that the key was forgiveness and love. Through all the stories that we go through in this life, your life and my life is a story. One day our stories will be told in eternity of how we love Jesus and how we live for Him, of how we love people. One day your stories and my stories will be the stories that we talk about in heaven. Thank God our story is not finished yet. So if your story is going to end wrongly, change it today. If your story is going to go a wrong direction, change it today. Because as long as there is love, there is hope. As long as there is love, there can be faith. As long as there is love, there can be a good ending. Because God works all things out for good to those who love Him. So may God touch our hearts today and understand the right things that Job did. And the main thing comes back to this. That in all our test trials and temptation, it only makes our love grow stronger. If it is truly love. It separates the false love from the true love. It separates those who want the benefits of love from those who are champions of love. It separates those who are just riding on love from those who are more than conquerors to whom He loves. It is the test, trials, and temptation that separate us. So think about it when you're going through a hard time, a test, a trial. Question, how great is your love? And I know one thing. God will not allow you to be tested, tried, or tempted beyond what you can. Somewhere on your inside, the life God chose for you, the life God helped you to live and choose, there is the grace of God to live your life. To live a legacy of love for eternity to yourself to your loved ones and for the songs that we will sing in heaven
In fact, some of you could be even named by, even your names could have a meaning in how you're going to find your victory. God chose you. He has given you the grace, the ability, the strength to live the life of love. Not all of us can be the same. Not all of us face the same platform. Not all of us have the same positions in society, in life. But all of us in life need one thing. We all here want to be loved. We all here enjoy being loved. We all here know how wonderful love is. We all here know that a life without love is a poverty life. And we are rich only when we are rich in love. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you reach down into the corridors of our heart. In search our hearts, oh God. And see, Lord, that there are times that we are broken, we are tested, we are tried. We go through tribulation. We have hard times, but we thank you for the good times. We have the valleys, but we have the mountains. We have the green pastures, but we have the valley of the shadow of death. Father, Psalms 23 is the road most of us have. That you prepare a table for us in the presence of enemies. We have green pastures lie beside still waters. We do go to the valley of the shadow of death at times. And there are times, Lord, when it's a rocky ground and hard places. But Father, we thank you. When there is only one Job, and that's the story in the Bible. And we are all not Job's, Lord. We are all called by different names. Whether it be Peter, Andrew, Simon, Alice, and Nancy or whatever. We all have different names. But we all have different stories. And in the end, all our story is a story of how love triumphs in our life. And how love conquer all in our life. So Father God, we ask that you stir our heart to love you. That you stir our heart to understand how to love others the way you love. You stir our heart to forgive where love is so difficult. We thank you, Father. You rise great within us, even today. Thank you, Father God, for your love and forgiveness in our life. In our midst today, and those listening to this word, wherever you are, in your heart, you have bitterness. You have people who have hurt you. People who have caused you pain. And life could have been a bitter pill to swallow for you. Perhaps you go through situations where it's easier to end your life than to continue your life. There's only one road to take. Not the road to the valley of death but the road called forgiveness. Like the woman at the well where five husbands and the one she's living with was not her husband. What she was looking for was true love, which she could not find in physical love until she found Jesus. Deep in each one of our hearts, we are all only a little child and baby. No matter whether you're 100 years old or you're 17 or you're 40 or 20 or 30, 
We are all little children in Him. Inside us, we are all just crying for one thing and one thing alone. We want to be loved. We want to be loved even when we were a child. Sometimes we grow up without that love. We want to be loved when we grow up and sometimes that love was not given. We want to be loved as adults and sometimes we don't find the love. But Jesus is here at the door of your heart who says that He loves you. And He's here to heal your broken heart. He's here to heal your brokenness. If you will let His love flow to you. Because you say, no one understands me. No one knows what the pain you have gone through. But I want you to know, Jesus was hanging on the cross. He knew that pain. He knew the pain of rejection. He knew what it was like to love and not be loved. He knew what it was like to be betrayed, to be rejected, to be despised. He knew what it was like. And yet, He forgave and He loved. When we were all little children, the capacity to love was given to us by God. We all had a capacity to love. And innocent. Somehow as we were growing, that capacity got corrupted. And God is here to restore it in your life. Even right where you are seated, wherever you are, just reach out to God wherever you are. And right now, let His healing love touch you. You can pray in your own way to God and call out to Him. Now let that love fill your heart and mind. Reach out to Jesus in your heart. Allow Him into your life and into your heart, into the very room where you are. And let His love fill you. But you must forgive in order for His love to flow. It's like a tap. Unless you release forgiveness, His love cannot flow through you. Release that forgiveness to everyone who hurt you, everyone who despised you, everyone who betrayed you, everyone who did evil to you. From the time that you were a child, right to where you are today. Release forgiveness. Release only love and forgiveness. And the love of Jesus will flow to you right now. <laughs> Father, touch and heal. Touch and heal broken hearts right now. Touch and heal broken lives, oh God. Heal the bitterness with sweetness, oh God. Oh Lord, release your love. Increase the capacity to love in our hearts and our lives, oh Lord. Let there be enduring love, oh Lord, in our heart and in our life. Let the love grow in the capacity, even as we sit in your presence, oh Lord. Father, we allow your love to flow right now. We see only Jesus in all his fullness. Oh, we thank you, Father, for your love to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank 
people. Oh, let the Son of God be holy in His ways. Let's all rise this morning. I know the Lord has touched some of you while you are there in your seats. But if there be anyone here that feels that you need a fuller release, then feel free to come right to the front and kneel down before the Lord. And we anoint you with all and release what the Lord has begun to do even while you were sitting in a congregation. Thank you, Jesus. And let His love and healing touch your life. Father God, we commit each one of us here into your hands, those here, those hearing your word. Let that same spirit, Lord, that has been working in our hearts and minds, continue working in our life, in our hearts and minds, even when we leave this place. Continue to show us the world as you see it. A world made and created, permitted in its imperfection so that we can learn the one most important lesson in life, that love is everything. And even as we go from this place, we ask that your light will shine upon us. And you bless, and you keep each one, Lord, in your ways and in your blessing. And let the Spirit of God continue to fill us with this divine love that you have given in Christ. And let there be strength imparted. Let there be life imparted. Let there be power imparted upon the hearts and lives of each one here. So that today we know we have truly met Jesus Christ. And we have been touched to the core of our being by His loveliness by His great love for us. So seal this work in our lives today and let your miracle begin in each one of our lives, in our walk with you, in every step of our lives, in every pathway of life. Let the power that makes all things work together for good be upon each one of us. So that living this place today, We know truly the future is bright. The days ahead are days filled with love. That we will indeed see the glory of God in our lifetime. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.
dismissed and those who need ministry, we'll minister to you.